Don't you tell me that he's not the God of yesterday, today, and forevermore. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We're making a declaration today that there are going to be more miracles, signs, and wonders in here. And this is why, yeah, thank you for the few handcuffs. I believe all of us want to see that. Cancer free. All the things that we, I mean, I want you to listen to this. Even diabetes, we rebuke the spirit of diabetes. The spirit of heart failure, high blood pressure. I'm telling you, our God, there is nothing too hard for our God. I'm telling you, family. Boy, let me get into this word and time. Jesus, Lord, have mercy. Glory to God. Hallelujah. The next three weeks, we'll, we will begin to discuss the awakening. The Lord gave me this name, and I said, Lord, the awakening. He said, yes, call it the awakening, and I want you to take your time because this message that I'm giving you is not just a preach word. It's a teach word. It's also a word that you need to know in the importance of what God is requiring of you and I to move in in this season. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I'm going to draw your attention this morning to Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Simple, well-known scripture in the Amplified Version. It says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then the Amplified Version says, do not be conformed to this world any longer with its superficial values and customs, but be transformed and progressively change as you maturely, spiritually, or maturely, spiritually, by the renewing of your what? Your mind. Focusing on God's values and ethical attitudes so that you may what? Prove for who? Yourself. What the will of God is, that what is good and acceptable and perfect in his plan. How many of you know that God has a plan for you? And purpose. There's a plan and a purpose. Say it again. There's a plan and the purpose. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Family, if the mind was not important, it would not be worth renewing. Paul is writing to a church, not unbelievers, but to a church in Rome. He's telling them the importance of renewing your mind. Because God values the intellect of an individual. Romans chapter 7, verse 25, don't have to pull it up, but it talks about it's with the mind that we honor the laws of God, which is the word of God. It is with the mind. Paul is saying it is with the flesh that we sin. Okay? And so it's important that you understand that God wants us to have a renewed mind because his intentions back in the Garden of Eden was for you and I to be able to have the likeness and the image, which means not only looking like God and speaking like God, but thinking like gods, like little g gods, because he's our father. And the Bible reminds us, family, in Galatians and please hear this, Galatians chapter 5, verse, I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, that we are called to be imitators of our Father. We're called to be like him. Jesus came to the earth for many reasons, one of which we know he redeemed man back to God. But he also came that we would see the image of God. Because Jesus said, when you see me, you see the Father. So he's letting you know that this is the image of God, his love, his authority, his wisdom, his counsel. Amen. And so I've come to this place that renewing the mind is the target of the Lord. Every single day of your life, renewing the mind. Say that with me, renewing. Transformation 
of a person's life is no greater than the transformation of the mind. You can be saved and go to heaven, but if you have not transformed your mind, you're still enslaved to a degree that you're not moving in the functions that God wants you to move to represent him in the earth. And so Paul is saying this, and we've quoted the scriptures, and some of you know the scripture easily. You just, it's, it's engraved in your subconscious. But do you understand what Paul is saying to us, that we must have a transformed mind? And I've come to this ideology, why Jesus, the first words he said in Matthew chapter 14, verse 17, the Bible says, and he said, repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This word re, it is, it is a prefix of pent. But the key is when Jesus is saying repent, not only is he saying turn from your ways, but he says change your ways. The way you think. The way you move. And I've discovered family, and this is why we see so much repeatedness, that people can come to the altar sincerely and want to be delivered, want to be free from the infirmities or the actions or things that they're doing, and they turn by coming here, but if they have not turned their mind, and if they have not been taught how to reprogram their mind, they'll find themselves back in the same state that they want Sub, uh, uh, want consciously to come out. Someone say consciously. Hallelujah. Listen, the Bible is targeting not just merely the discipline of right thoughts, but living from the perception of reality that is greater than the physical world. And that is the spiritual world. Someone say the spiritual world. That means God's world, the fourth dimensional world, the thing that that Paul said, things that are seen in 1 Corinthians are temporal, but things that are not seen are yet eternal. That's in the fourth dimensional world. In other words, before it comes into the natural, the, the third dimensional world, it's going to manifest and already be in existence in the fourth. That's why we're called to call those things that be not because if you are in line with the word of God, you are able to see the promises of God. And how many of you know that God knows what you're going to declare, but he wants you to say it out of your mouth. That the devil can see that he's aligned his will with your will and it will manifest. So it's not that he doesn't know what you're going to say. He just wants you to be like him in the earth. That's why he told, he told Adam to name the animals. It wasn't that these animals were not named. He was showing Adam speaks like me, talks like me, knew the animals in the spirit realm, and he called them by name because God already gave them a name in heaven. How many of you know that we're going to see lions, tigers, and bears, oh my, <laughs> in heaven? We're going to see it because God created everything before he manifested in the earthly realm. Let me keep going. So family, the fact of the matter is God is showing me that this is so key because what he's teaching me over the course of my life, that there are critical parts of the mind. You have a brain and you have a mind. Someone say mind, mind. Brain. brain. Brain is what houses the mind. Brain allows your body to function. It has billions of nerves that the brain is connected to that knows how to call it to function when the mind says move. The mind is part of a, a, a three-dimensional system and I want to call it three critical parts. Can I teach you this a little bit today? Because I'm going to tell you why people come back to the state that they were in when they come to try to ask to a change. There's a method to the madness, family. And as shepherds, we haven't taught enough of this. So people can really begin to see deliverance in their lives. Can I teach y'all? Y'all all right? Let me, let me talk to you today. 
There are three critical parts, three functions of our minds. Number one, you have the function of the conscious mind. Someone say the conscious mind. The conscious mind learns in creative fashions. It desires to have knowledge in something that it, it, it wants to be aware. It's awake. That's why when you begin to hear music, you begin to quote the music because the subconscious mind is listening. And if you listen to it over and over again, the subconscious mind not only keeps it, but moves us, move it back in the subconscious mind where your program system, your database is there. And now you can begin to quote things because you did something repetitiously. Someone say repetition. Repetition creates habits. And this is why it's important that when someone comes to a posture of giving their life to Christ Jesus, they have to know what's next. Hallelujah. And you have to know what's next. Someone say, I have to know what's next. So the conscious mind is desiring to have knowledge. That's why you, you look at television. I told uh, the economic development class, you should not look at a bad television, movie, or what have you before you go to bed. You need to be praying. You need to be writing out your goals. Amen? But what we've done, we've been so used to doing things in a repetitious way, but now, because it's now become a habit. Someone say a habit. Repetition creates habits. Some habits are not bad, but some habits are not good. And it keeps you stagnant from moving the way God wants you to move, from being around the right associations that God wants you to be around. Old habits will keep you around bad friends. It'll keep you around people that you know that's not giving you any productivity. Amen? So the conscious mind learns, creates, desires to have knowledge. Someone say knowledge. The subconscious mind makes decisions without needing to actively think about things. Because it's the, it's the program system. You've been programmed. Some of you can get up automatically and go right into your bedroom. Or not your bedroom, I'm sorry, your bathroom. Some of you have a tendency when you get up, you may say hi to your spouse if you're married. And if you're not, either which way, you say hi to them, you should be saying hi to God first, praise God. And then you say hi to your spouse. But the next thing you do is grab your phone and see who called you. See who texts you. It's become a habit. Someone say habit. A habit that's not necessarily going to produce anything unless you're expecting a call. Amen? But to automatically go there or even go to the Facebook automatically. Something that's not going to give you any value. Are you hearing me? So the subconscious mind makes decisions without needing actively think about things. Our subconscious mind has a program habit. Programs are habits that have been repetitiously occurring. Someone say repetitiously occurring. Say it again, repetitiously occurring. The subconscious affects our thoughts. It affects our feelings. It affects our behavior, our causes. It, it causes us to, to get emotional, to respond quickly, to remember who, who dogged us uh, the other week and we saw him again and you said if they say something smart again, I'm going to give them a piece of my mind because the subconscious mind remember what they said. Unforgiveness is placed in the subconscious mind. That's why it's hard to forgive. Because the subconscious mind, that's where the devil starts going in to pull out things that were negative to make you think about something that God told you to forgive a long time ago. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? And so, but there's something, something that we haven't been taught. Some of you may have heard conscious mind and subconscious mind. But there's another terminology that's called the analytical mind. The analytical mind. Someone say analytical. The analytical mind. That's the mind that analyzes. It analyzes the situation. Whereby if it's not bad, it'll keep it in the subconscious mind. It analyzes what you've done. Some of you get up every day and truth be told, you do the same thing all the time. 
Some of you will, 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 not, will not leave because you said, I didn't drink my coffee today. But your body didn't ask for the coffee at all. It's the subconscious mind that's used to getting what you've been doing all the while. Some of you will not stop the way you talk. You talk a certain way because subconsciously you have been programmed to talk that way, even if it's not proper English. And I've come to learn and study, on, uh, family, that everything that has been considered professions in this earthly realm, some people are uh, airline pilots. They were, they were trained from the conscious that it would be stored in the subconscious to know how to fly the plane. Hallelujah. There were people that are in professions, doctors and lawyers, and, and uh, uh, there, there's all types of people, nurse practitioners, uh, there's engineers, people that are mechanics. You have been trained, starting from the conscious mind to be stored in the subconscious mind that you can do it effortlessly, which tell me why God values the mind in the individual. Because he knew, he knows that if he can get your mind to serve him, the rest of it will freely and willingly do what he desires you to do. And the problem is, family, I'm going somewhere. The problem is, is that we are called to live by the word of God. Jesus said, man should not live by bread, but by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So then... The Bible was meant for daily use, not cake for special occasions. And what has happened, people just open the Bible when they need the occasion to get a word to help their psycho or psyche. But the Bible was meant for us to read every day. Or some people come and get the word and thank God you get the word. But your, your job is to get stirred in the word. That the scriptures I'm going to give you today, you're going to go back and read them yourself. And you're going to take the notes. And let me tell you how bad the subconscious mind is. If you have not stored to prioritize to go over the notes that you've been uh, uh, writing down when you're in Bible study or if you're in a service like this and you don't rehearse the notes because the subconscious mind was never able to be told on a regular basis that you got to read the word. You didn't just write that down on a piece of paper for you to throw it away and put it back in the garbage. But what happens, people are so interested in being tickled. The Bible says in, first, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, that in the last days there will be perilous time and men will be lovers of themselves and lovers of money. Also, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Hallelujah. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. Glory to God. It says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap themselves to themselves teachers having itching ears. Well, I'm going to tell you something right now. If you want me to itch you, it ain't happening. <laughs> Because we've been itched long enough. We've been tickled. We've been, we, we, we know how to jump. We can do cartwheels and that's cool. But if you haven't changed your mind, if you haven't begun to speak and change the trajectory of your course and your goals, you're just wasting time and the devil's laughing because he's saying to himself, you will never really know the potential that God could have manifested in you because I got your mind. Remember that the Lord is giving us scriptures that Paul, Peter wrote, be sober and diligent for the, for, for the devil, what? The devil seeketh whom he may devour. Is that a physical devour? No, it's a what? A spiritual. It's going into your mind. Now, let me get into this because I need you to really hear me today. And I believe God's going to do something extraordinary. Hallelujah. Someone pull on this anointing. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, 
It, it says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Glory to God. It's for you to know how to let this mind be in you. What is that mind? That mind is a place of submission and willingly wanting to do what God desires you to do. That you're not just participating uh, with the world system because the world system has a bad system that is the enemy against the will of God. That's why the Bible reminds us that we're called to be in the world but not Come on, talk to me. Not of the world. That means that if the, if the world's going to know that we're a peculiar people, we can't act like the world. And this is where we're having strongholds. Strongholds are hopelessness. Are, strongholds are things that are impregnated with hopelessness. It, it says, you just, you just say, well, this is who I am. I've heard people say that, and I used to say that when I was ignorant too. Well, this is who I am. I used to tell my wife that. She said, no, that ain't who you are. I didn't marry that. I didn't marry that. Some... I had to listen to what she was saying. No, no, God wants you to change. Someone say change. change. Say it again, change. change. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I want to go to Romans chapter 5, or Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 10. And this is the amplified version. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Mm. Family, before I go there, a mind, uh, a renewed mind creates the context of faith. Say that with me. A renewed mind creates the context of faith. I understand that the Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 10, that with the heart that believes, we believe unto righteousness. It says that. But the heart and the mind coexist and it represents one another because with the heart, the mind thinks and with the think, I mean, with the, with the mind, the, the heart settles and feels a certain kind of way. Amen? Amen? Amen. Now, this scripture Paul is writing, it says, for those who are living according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh, which is what? Gratifying the body. But those who are living according to the Spirit see their minds on the things of the Spirit, His will and purpose. Now the mind of the flesh is death both now and forever because it pursues sin. But the mind of the Spirit is life and peace, the spiritual well-being that comes from walking with God both now and forever. Check this out. The mind of the flesh with its sinful pursuits is actively hostile to God. Someone say hostile. This word means it's at war. It's an enemy. It's at war with God. It does not submit itself to God's laws since it can what not? It cannot, right? It can't, it can't do it. But those who are in the flesh living a life that what? Caters to sin appetites and impulses cannot please God. Whoever, read it together, whoever you are, whoever. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him and is not a child of God. I didn't say that. The word of God said that. And thank you for saying however. I was like, who? Okay, praise God. If Christ lives in you, though your natural body is dead, is sin. Your spirit is alive because of what? Righteousness, which he provides. Amen? Now, family, I, I want to get this clear because some people have asked this question. What is the difference of having a, a, a carnal mind and a spiritual mind? Someone say carnal. Someone say spiritual. A carnal mind is your own desires. It, it causes you to move in your flesh. It's not in line at all with the will of God. Because one thing I've discovered, the flesh knows it has its time. So it tries to get its groove on as much as it can. Y'all know what I'm talking about. From dust we came, 
and from dust we will return. A spiritual mind is having a mindset of spiritual things, spiritual beliefs by the word of God that influences us. Please hear this in the direction and behavior we're called to move by. That's a spiritual mind. You have the heart of God. That's why God, Jesus said in um, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, that seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. God knows we need things. But the fact of the matter is, God wants to know, are you going to prioritize him before the things? Amen. I'm going to let that settle because some of us are prioritizing things. If we get up, I'm telling you, let, let me just put this out here. I got to put this out here quick. God showed me that there are some people that are designed and called to be multimillionaires. Thank you for the two, three, hallelujah. I, I, I was hoping to hear a shout that I was talking to somebody out there. Praise God. <laughs> But, but, I mean, I'm telling you, if you don't change your mind, you could never manage the millions that God wants you to have. Don't you think that God wants us to be poor and broke and, and that's how Christians are supposed to be? The devil is a liar. How can you be influential if you're broken, disgusted, and sick and always complaining? You're not blessed. You're not manifesting the blessing. You are blessed, but you're not manifesting the blessing because I'm telling you, God said that we're called to be influential people. But listen to me, if you're not trying to grow your mind and learn more and, and not settle for where you are, you'll find yourself in a cycle of nothing and stagnation, and then you get mad and ask the question, why aren't I advancing in life? And I have an answer for you, because your subconscious mind has never been deprogrammed. It moves the same way, thinks the same way works the same way, buys the same thing. I mean, there are certain people in this place that when you get a little extra money, you go out and buy some Louis Vuittons, you go out and buy some Gucci, you go out and buy some Versace, you go out and buy Chanel, and you know you should have kept that money because you've been broke for the past two months. You should have put that money in your savings account, but no, you want to you, you wanna look good. You want to, you, you know, perpetrate. No, no, save the money and show God that I can manage what you give me from this day forward. And so God will not give us anything that would hurt us. I realized that after all these years, I said, Lord, thank you for loving me that much. Because no good parent is going to give a child something that they know they cannot manage. You're not going to give your child a brand new Mercedes Benz and they're 11 years old and they never drove a car. You're not going to give your child that has candy issues, a big stone crowd of candy, and just say, okay, I want you just to eat once a day. You think he's going to eat once a day? Because he hasn't manifest being disciplined in the mind. Are y'all hearing, Pastor? And everything you do and say, and please hear, hear this, manifests by a, do, a dominating force. So what you are doing right now is manifesting a dominant force in your life who controls your mind. What you say manifests the dominating force who you are really being led by. We know that we're called to be led by the Holy Spirit. We are called to let him be the ingenuity that leads us into all truths. We know that. But what you say manifests the dominating force in your life. And the quality of your life is directly tied to the conditions of your mind. It is with the mind that we serve the Lord. I can't get off this. this. This let me walk with this. God's pushing me somewhere because the enemy don't want you to hear this because the enemy wants you to stay in the same mind, mindset. He wants you to stay the same. He wants you to talk the same. He wants you to respond the same when someone says something to you that you know you should not respond by. How many of you had people push your buttons? Mm-hmm. And know exactly what to say to make you get mad. 
a comeback. I had a lot of those buttons. But I've been telling my wife, I heard you over there, "Mm mm-hmm. I said, baby, them buttons are getting out, they're out of order. I had one more button, I didn't realize it was still working. (laughs) I took a, she, it's like she knows that button, Mm. But, but it literally helps us understand that God wants us to have a, a mind that is in line divinely with his will. It doesn't mean that you can't live well and, and, and acknowledge the earth. No, you acknowledge the earth, but you live by the ways of God. This is what he wants us to do. Live by his ways. Someone say, live by his ways. I got a few things I want you to take a picture of. What is spiritual mindedness? What is spiritual mindedness? Please take a snapshot, look at it. A spiritual mind pursues after God. A spiritual mind pursues after God. A spiritual mind is keeping Jesus at the center of it all. Hallelujah. A spiritual mind separates lifestyles and consecrate themselves. A spiritual mind, it requires and it knows that it's called to be holy, to live holy, to not participate with the things of the world. Doesn't mean you're going to be a perfect person, but you're striving for perfection. You're not going to let your life dictate what's going to happen in your future, your mindset. And that's why God will bring people around each other. I call it the power of association. That there are certain seasons and times that God will bring people around you or you will be in the right environment to hear the right thing that what needs to come out of you right now will begin to matriculate out of your life. I declare and decree that you're not here by happenstance and God is talking to all of you that there is a subconscious mind and that there is a conscious mind yet there is an analytical mind that is analyzing where you are. I declare in decree today that your analytical mind is going to say to itself, wait a minute, we are not where we should be subconscious mind and it's time for us to get better than where we are. So I'm going to open myself consciously and I'm going to receive more data and I'm going to repeat reading it and saying it over and over and over again, over and over and over again over and over and over again because repetition creates habits. Repetition, say that with me, creates habits. You cannot read a book and grab all of its nutrients if you're reading a book that has some type of education or knowledge one time. I discovered that every time I go back and read the the same book, I see something that I didn't see before. And I have, I'm old school, I have a thing, I highlight things. I got yellow everywhere, yellow everywhere. So I'm reading the book again, and I'm like, why didn't I highlight that? Because I didn't see it. But where I was, I needed to see something that was said that would help me stay in alignment with the will of God. Are you hearing me? And so it's important that you say things over and over again. Do you know why? Because what you don't fix gets inherited. Oh, let me say that again. Y'all looked at me like this here. What you don't fix gets inherited. I know every last one of the mothers and fathers that's in this place today want better for their children if you are a loving parent, but I'm telling you, what you don't fix gets inherited. You can push them, you can encourage them to go to school, but they're going to look at you, and there are certain things that what you are doing is going to go down to get inherited. Oh, y'all listening to me, ain't you? I like this. Eating it, that's right. Y'all ain't getting no cake today. Matter of fact, you ain't never getting no cake up in this pulpit in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. So it is imperative that we understand 
that we must be willing and desiring to feed the subconscious. Jesus chose his disciples. John chapter 15 tells us that you didn't choose me, but I've chosen you and ordained you that you would go forth and bear fruit and that your what? Fruit should remain. But Jesus understood that these men had professions. These men had professions that, were, that has been so trained and programmed that this is what they called themselves. He said that I'm going to make you fisher of men to Peter and John and James because he knew that they were programmed to be fishermen. They were professionals at it. They knew exactly what time to go out, how to throw the nets out, how to draw it back in. But this particular time when he went to see them, they didn't catch anything. All their professionalism. And he said, listen, young men, cast your net on the other side. This other side means the other side of your thinking as well. Now, Peter looked and said, well, Master, we've been toiling all day, but at your word, at your word, I'm going to do it. And because of them not being rebellious, they saw what God, Jesus was telling them they could see. They had no clue how much would be drawn from the Come on now. Because they were tolling all night. But they caught so much fish, the Bible says, that they had to ask their partners to come over. And both boats were filled where the Bible says, and their the boats began to sink. Let me tell you something. Because Jesus calls you, he provides for you. He understood that their calling was a big calling and so their families and the people that had responsibilities had to be able to make that money with all those fishes that were in those boats. So when he called them to follow him, they didn't lose nothing. As a matter of fact, I believe, and I'm going to tell you something, this is pastor's belief, that in three years time, that was enough fish to take care of their families while they were gone. Oh, y'all didn't catch that. That Jesus is not going to call you to a place and not make provisions for you. There's an old saying, where he guides, he provides. And that's why when we begin to reprogram our subconscious mind, we'll realize that when we move by the word of God and by obedience of the word of God, we cannot go wrong because God will make that thing come together. Someone say, it'll come together. Say it again, it'll come together. Hallelujah. The Bible reminds us in Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7, as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. What does that mean, his heart? That word heart means mind. His mind is not with you. His mind is not in line with your will. His mind, he's still thinking of all the negative things that the doctors told him and they're thinking about the things that people have spoke over their lives and they're thinking about the bill collectors that spoke negative and told them they're going to get something taken from them and they're remembering what the doctors said about them having to take prescription for the rest of their life or maybe we have to amputate a body part or maybe you have to take chemo but I'm here to tell you that when you have the mind of God, you have the mind of Christ, you'll remember what the word of God said. God says, by the stripes of Jesus, you are healed. God says that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in every circumstances you are seeing in your life. And that's why when you have a changed mind, you have a powerful source that the devil cannot penetrate. And the devil wants you to think that everything you're going through is not going to change. But I'm here to tell you that something's about to change in your life. Something's about to change in your life. Something's about to change in your life. 
I understand that there are times that people cannot function because their analytical mindset has has allow the subconscious to stay there and they're not doing anything differently. They're not reading books. They're not looking for new associations. They're not believing for God for breakthrough. They're not giving their tithes and offering to show their faithfulness. They're not doing the things that's required and they're looking for answers and God says, I am the answer, but if you listen to my direction, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Mm. I feel pushed by the Holy Spirit right now. There's a story in the book of Acts that Peter and James was doing a work. And the Bible says that Herod killed James. The Bible reminds us, and I don't have the scripture up, but if you can possibly pull it up. I feel a push. Acts chapter 12, starting in verse 6. If you can put the New Living Translation up too. Acts chapter 12, verse 6. But this story talks about Peter and James, and James is being murdered, and now Herod is about to kill Peter, he thinks, because he has him in jail. And the Bible says that the night before Peter was to, to be placed on trial, He was asleep, fastened with two chains between two soldiers. Others stood guard at the prison gate. Suddenly, there was a bright light in the cell, and an angel of the Lord stood before Peter. The angel struck him on the side to awaken him and said, quick, get up. And the chains fell off his wrist. And then the angel of the Lord told him, get dressed and put on your sandals. And he did. Now put on your coat and follow me. The angel ordered. Listen to this. So Peter left the cell following the angel. But all the time he thought it was a vision. He didn't realize it was actually happening. They passed by the first and second gate posts and came to the iron gate leading to the city. And this opened for them all by itself. So they passed through and started walking down the street and the angel suddenly left him. Peter finally came to his senses. Mm -hmm. It's really true, he said. The Lord has sent his angels, sent his angels to save me from Herod and from what the Jewish leader had planned to do to me. The first step, I've come to realize that when you are getting a transformation, it comes by steps. Peter was a man that trusts God And Peter did not understand the fullness of this potential. But I have to say this because I I love Peter. I don't think Peter had fear. I don't think Peter was worried because when you have fear and worry, there's no way you can sleep and you know you're going to be murdered the next day. You'll be talking to God all day. Oh, God. Oh, God. Please, God. But, But what this describes to me is that Peter has gotten this epiphany that he trusts God. Yet, it looks like it could be difficult because he's behind, he's with two soldiers and there's guards all through the path. But there is nothing impossible to him who believe. So the Bible says, the angels smoke him. And told him to wake up. Put on your clothes. The key is, Peter responded. He didn't say, who? Who are you? Are you sent from God? He didn't ask none of those questions. He listened to the orders of the angel. He said, get up. Awake. Get up. 
put on your clothes and put on your sandals, put on your cloak. It's time to go. Now, the Bible did not say that the jail opened. It said the gates opened. So that tells me that they were able to go through the gates. And they were able to not awaken soldiers. Now understand, the Bible says the change dropped. If any change drop, wouldn't you think they would hear something? Unless God shut their ears. See, God can shut the ears of your enemy. He can make your enemy cause, be caused to love you. He will make your enemies do things that you didn't ever expect that they would do from you. God has the power to change anything. And that's why God says, love your enemies. Because they do, they do not know what they do to you. They don't know that you are my anointed. And if they keep messing around and keep doing things that I don't want them to do, trust me, I'll take care of it. Because the battle's not yours, it's the Lord. Amen? So here we have Peter going through the gates. And God gave me this epiphany that, that each step he began to realize that he was no longer dreaming. See, some of you are coming to this epiphany to think that God may get you out, but what if he doesn't? This is a level that God wants to break you out of. This is what's stuck in the subconscious. The subconscious mind for individuals who've been saved for a long time and going to church, they know the right jerger. They know what to say, how to say it, praise the Lord. And then they know that when they leave, they can be another person. Uh-huh. They, they say, praise the Lord in here and cuss you out out there. They have two languages because it's in the subconscious. It never got delivered. Praise the Lord, Pastor. Praise the Lord. You might, you, I'm telling you, I, I know because there are people that I've called in this church, and I do that sometimes. And uh, I say, hello? I say, hey, how you doing? Who is this? Um, who, I said, who is this? Uh, apostle? Oh, uh, Apostle. <laughs> now, I've never seen that attitude in face-to-face. But I knew the attitude was there the way they talked to me on the phone before they found out who I was. That's why I'm talking to you right now, because I know some of you can relate what I'm saying. Uh huh. But that mindset must not take presence over your life, because there can be a time that if you don't get rid of that mindset, you can be in the right place and not move and the right jogger. You, you, you begin to speak contrary and don't realize that the person you've been praying God or the breakthrough you've been praying for is right in your face. When Peter went out of the gates, he realized that he was no longer, he, 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 did, he wasn't dreaming, he, he had an epiphany. He realized this was real. And this is what God told me. He said, son, I want you to come by and tell them that I, that I am their angel. I'm the angel. I'm the messenger. I'm telling you, wherever you've been, whatever state you've been in, I'm smoking you in the spirit, and I'm telling you to wake up! It's not over until God says it's over. God has more in store for you. There's something greater in you. Don't you settle for where you are. And stop hanging around people that's not giving you any type of productivity. Stop being obligated to hang out with Nene and Susu and all those people because they're not adding to your life. You can talk to them on the phone, but give them one minute. It's time for you to realize that God is calling you to wake up from the states that you've been in. Your job does not talk about your anointing, your job, your peop the people that you have in your life does not classify where you are and where you're going. I'm telling you, God wants you to know that there's something greater in you, and I'm, by I'm the angel coming by to say, wake up! Get up from the chains of mediocrity and of foolishness. Get up! Wake up! There's something more in you that meets the eye. You are not born to be ordinary. You are not born to be normal. You were born to be extraordinary. God did not choose you that you would just get back. God chose you to change circumstances and trajectories and lay hands on the sick and speak prophetically in people's lives. Glory to God. See, 
I want us to be like Paul as I'm closing. Paul was a proven fact that his mind changed because you can't write to Rome and says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind if he hasn't transformed his mind yet. There are some people that are so settled in their mind, they go to sleep in church, they get tired, they look at their clocks, they're on the phone because their subconscious mind has programmed them to shut down after a certain amount of time. Or they want me just to holler. No, I'm not hollering. I'm talking to your spirit man. Paul was the epitome of having a changed mind because anywhere he went, any city he went to, he never stopped doing the things God had him do. When he was thrown in jail, him and Silas, in the book of Acts chapter 16, the Bible says that they were singing hymns and all types. They didn't didn't sing hymns for, for them to be released. He said, oh, God, get me out. They whipped my back. My back's hurting. I'm bleeding. Lord, no. He said, hallelujah. 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 And all of a sudden, because you know what, when you give that type of worship and you're worshiping in spirit and in truth, there's no way that Paul and Silas is worshiping in the flesh. That was all spirit and truth. They didn't know that that God was going to shake the jails and release them, but they didn't care because they knew at the end of the day, God had the last say over every situation because they just experienced the power of God manifesting in that realm. And God is telling me, tell somebody, I want you to worship in the midst of chaos because you let every demonic force, every attack, every enemy, to know that my God is still in control of every situation. I'm telling you, Paul was one of my heroes outside of Jesus himself being the hero of heroes. But Paul, in the book of Acts chapter 28, the Bible says when they landed on the island and they were, he was grabbing bundles, hallelujah, in Acts, uh, Acts chapter 28, verse 3 through 6, hallelujah. New Living Translation. Put me New Living Translation. I just want to hit this real quick and I'm going to close. I, I got to say this. As Paul gathered an armful of sticks and was laying them on the fire, a poisonous snake driven out by the heat bit him on the hand. And the people of the island saw it was hanging from his hand and said to each other, a murderer, no doubt. Though he escaped the sea, justice will not permit him to live. But Paul, I said, Paul shook off the snake into the fire and was unharmed. But the people waited for him to swell up or suddenly drop dead. But when they had waited a long time and saw that he wasn't harmed, they changed They change their mind. In other words, if your minds change, you can make other people's minds change. You can make other people change about how they think about you. And I'm telling you, it's time for you to shake off everything. All the doubt, all the haters, all the bad doctor's reports, All the things the enemy has trying to do and attack your mind, suicidal thoughts, depressional thoughts. It's time to shake those things off because God has already set the course for you. 
Jeremiah chapter 11, verse 29 says, I, he, no, verse 29, chapter 29, verse 11, he says, I have thoughts of good and not of evil to give you a hope and a future. And that's why it's important that you begin to shake off things that's trying to attach in your subconscious mind. I come against every demonic force, every power, every power of darkness that's trying to stop you from being a dominant force in the earth. I rebuke every foul spirit that's keeping your marriage in captivity. I declare and decree that you'll see your husband and your wife differently, that you'll bless them and lay hands on them, and you'll speak those things that you want to come out of their life instead of complaining about the things that they're doing wrong. I declare and decree that there's a new season and a mandate that God is calling you to, that you will be the people of God, and you will be life changes. You will manifest the power of God in your life and you will not settle and you will grow your mind and learn the word of God and speak in atmospheres and look in the mirror and even talk to yourself and tell yourself I am blessed and highly favored. I am above and not beneath. I am a lender and not a borrower. Oh my God. I'm telling you there's a season and that season is now and God wants you to know that he's kept you for such a time as this and it's time for you to wake up. I said wake up. God has a calling on your life. Get from beyond those jails, those bars, those haters and wake up because there's something greater in you that God wants to manifest out of you. Somebody say, wake up. Wake up. What do you need to do to wake up? Well, Pastor, if I had a million dollars, shut up. If you don't have your mind right, the first thing you'll do is just spend it. And give all the family a little something, something, because they're your homies and they're your family. This is what happens to people when they, are, then when they hit the lotto. 120 million, now they file bankrupt in four or five years. What? In this house, I declare and decree a mature people that will grow in the Word of God because the Word of God is the most powerful thing that exists. Period. There's nothing else more powerful than the Word of God. The Bible says the grass will wither, the flowers will fade, but the Word of God will stand forever. Stand. And Paul says, therefore, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the works of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor will not be in vain of the Lord. Hallelujah. Live stream. We're going to the afterglow now. If you're in this valley, and even the ones that are part of this ministry, you don't want to miss the next two or three weeks. We're declaring miracles in this house. We're declaring breakthrough. The same God that, talk, that touched Dr. Betty Meir is the same God that will touch you. There's power and unity. I declare and decree that you will not miss the next week's coming and not look at this as just another day but this is a divine clarion call to you I declare and decree your life is shifting right now in Jesus name amen come on let's give God a praise hallelujah hallelujah